Okay. Um, so can you start the sign-in sheet around, please? Thank you. And looks like we're all on this side, so you can start this one over here. Okay, everybody, let me just do a quick sound check. Um, I can actually check on my, uh, can you give me a thumbs up or uh, indicate in chat if you have audio? Okay, good. All right, let me just get the chat up on the big screen and uh, we'll get started. Okay, so starting off, uh, just a couple announcements. Uh, so let me remind you again uh, about test number two coming up on uh, this Monday, which is, is that the 19th? Yes, uh, Monday the 19th. So uh, that means that uh, this coming Friday will be a review session. Um, I will get a, a study guide up on eCampus for you guys uh, sometime today. Uh, please look over the, um, the study guide and um, have questions ready when you come in for the review session on Friday. Okay, so again, I don't mind giving you guys an entire class section before every test for a review session, uh, as long as you take advantage of it. And uh, as long as people are coming, they're actually asking questions and we're actually getting something accomplished. All right. Um, as far as the test goes, again, remember that uh, you won't show up here on Monday the 19th. It's going to be administered online again. Uh, so make sure that you have internet access um, you know, on, a, on a reliable machine uh, because um, it will be administered online. Uh, again, it'll be during normal class time. So you know, 9 a.m. Monday morning, make sure you have internet access. You'll know, be ready to take the exam. Also. Remember, uh, I forgot about time restrictions last time. Um, you will be given a half hour to complete the, the main exam. And for the, um, the bonus question, that'll be separate. And you'll have eight minutes to complete the bonus question. Also, uh, so the last quiz before the exam is gonna be today. So uh, that'll be quiz 12. I'll have that online by, uh, by about noon today as usual. <laughs> Usually I have it on by noon when I get busy. Sometimes I forget, you guys know that. Um, if I do forget, please uh, shoot me an email, remind me, but I'll try to have that on uh, eCampus by noon. Uh, don't forget to study your quizzes. Again, I'm gonna take one question from each quiz, put it directly on the test. So um, it's uh, definitely study your quizzes. It's a good place to, to gain some points. And uh, what else? I think that's about it. Um, Anybody have any uh, questions or comments? I see there's some comments on, uh, on chat from Zoom uh, asking uh, whose turn is it Friday? Uh, so group B should be here. Uh, if you can make it, should be here in class for the review session. Um, everybody else should attend via Zoom. If there's no other questions, I think that's it for announcements. I don't see any questions from the class. I don't see any more on Zoom. So. When we left off, when we left off on Wednesday, we were doing a little bit of accounting. So we, we talked about all three stages of aerobic respiration. So we've got glycolysis, uh, we've got in between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, we have the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Uh, then we have the Krebs cycle. And finally, we have uh, oxidative phosphorylation, which is also known as the electron transport chain or ETC, okay? So we were doing a little bit of accounting. So remember, let's just go through all, all these uh, stages just as a, a refresher for you guys. So remember with glycolysis, we start with a six carbon glucose molecule, okay? Then we need to invest two ATP to get this metabolic reaction started. Okay, you can think about it as, um, an activation energy for the metabolic pathway, just like we have activation energies for, for individual reactions. So we need to invest two ATP to get this reaction started. After we get it started, we're gonna reduce two NAD to NADH. 
We're going to make four ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. So two ATP go to repay the energy debt that we incurred early on to get the metabolic pathway started. It means we get a net gain of two ATP. And in glycolysis, we don't reduce any FAD to FADH. In the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, oh, in glycolysis, I forgot the last part. In glycolysis, we end with two three carbon pyruvate molecules. In PDHC, we take those two three carbon pyruvate molecules and uh, we're gonna convert them into two acetyl-CoA. In the process, we're gonna reduce two NAD to NADH. And we're gonna make a molecule of CO2 and we're gonna consume a molecule of coenzyme A. Krebs cycle, for each, of, uh, for each acetyl-CoA that enters, we're going to uh, make one ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. So from PDHC, we get two acetyl-CoA. So we're gonna make two ATP per glucose molecule. For each acetyl-CoA, we're gonna get three NAD reduced to NADH. So again, for each glucose molecule, because we get two acetyl-CoA per glucose molecule, that means we're gonna get six NADH. And again, for each acetyl-CoA that enters the, this metabolic pathway, we're gonna get uh, one FAD reduced to FADH2. So per glucose molecule, that's two FADH2. Okay, and if we total all these up, that's four ATP from substrate level phosphorylation. We have 10 NAD reduced to NADH. We have four FAD reduced to FADH2. In the electron transport chain, each the electrons donated by NADH are worth three ATP. So for 10 NADH, this equals 30 ATP. The electrons donated from each FADH2 are equal to, uh, are, are gonna give us two ATP each. So four ATP. And we add all this up, four from substrate level phosphorylation, 30 from NADH, four from FADH2. We get a grand total of 38 ATP. Okay, and I had a question for you on Friday that we did, you guys didn't have a chance to answer for me. Um, so I've been telling you that we get 36, right? From metabolizing one molecule of glucose by aerobic respiration. Yet when we add up all the numbers, we get 38. Does anybody have any idea where those other two ATP go? Let me make sure I can see the, the chat over here. Anybody have any ideas? Let me give you a hint and see if you can figure it out. Where in the cell does glycolysis take place? Anybody remember that? So when I talked about glycolysis, I talked about um, PDHC. Cytoplasm. cytoplasm, okay? Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. Um, where does oxidative phosphorylation take place? Remember the enzymes that are involved in oxidative phosphorylation um, are embedded in the inner membrane of what? Not the chloroplast, what's the other, the other one that, that makes energy? Mitochondria, okay. So we have a relatively high concentration of NADH in the mitochondria and a relatively low concentration in the cytoplasm. So what kind of transport do we have to do to transport those two NAD into the, into the, the mitochondria? Active transport. Okay, active transport takes energy. So we have to burn two ATP to actively transport the NAD from glycolysis into the mitochondria so that they can give up their, ele their electrons to the electron transport chain. That's where those two ATP go, okay? So we have to subtract two 
to transport the NAD that was reduced to NADH by glycolysis. Okay, good job, guys. Not, not every class can figure that out. Okay, so let's go back. Well, I don't need to go back to the, um, to the PowerPoint, really. Um, so the last thing, one of the last things we're going to do in this chapter before we move on is I have another animation for you. Okay, and as we watch this animation, I want you guys to uh, pay attention because there are some mistakes in this animation. Okay, so you guys might remember um, when we did the animation, uh, there was a mistake. The, uh, the, the equation wasn't balanced for photosynthesis. There are two mistakes in this animation I'm about, I'm about to show you. Um, I'll point them out to you, but I want you guys to kind of pay attention and see if you can figure out where the mistakes are in this animation. All right, so here we go. I hope everybody has audio. Yep, looks like we do. glycolysis, enzymes in the cytoplasm partially break down glucose to form pyruvate. Two ATP are invested to start the process and four are produced for a net yield of two ATP. NAD is reduced to NADH when it picks up electrons and hydrogen ions stripped from intermediates in the pathway. Aerobic respiration continues in the mitochondria. The second stage is mainly a cyclic pathway called the Krebs cycle. Enzymes break down pyruvate to carbon dioxide. Two more molecules of ATP are produced. The coenzymes NAD and FAD are reduced to NADH and FADH2 when they pick up electrons and hydrogen ions. In the final stage, electron transfer phosphorylation, the reduced coenzymes give up electrons and hydrogen to electron transfer chains. As electrons pass through the chain, hydrogen ion, electrical, and concentration gradients are created. The gradients drive ATP formation at ATP synthases. At the end of the third stage, Oxygen accepts electrons and hydrogen to form water. The typical net energy yield from aerobic respiration of a glucose molecule is 36 ATP. The first two stages produce a small amount of ATP, but the bulk is generated during the final stage. Now let's check what you have learned. Drag the appropriate text to the blanks to complete the diagram of glycolysis. Okay, so can anybody either on Zoom or in class. Uh, let's do this top box first. Um, which term from the left-hand side here goes in this box at the top? Anybody? So what, what enters, so I gave you those five points. What, what, what enters the glycolytic pathway? What's the molecule that, that we start with? Glucose. Okay. So we're going to add electrons and protons to something. What's, uh, what type of molecules assist enzymes by carrying electrons, protons, or functional groups? Okay, I see uh, answers from, uh, from the Zoomers. NADH, yeah, so NAD is gonna pick up two electrons and a proton, and we're gonna form NADH. Okay, how about the end product of glycolysis that's gonna enter PDHC? Pyruvate, I see from Zoom, very good. Pyruvate goes here. That's correct. Glycolysis breaks glucose down to pyruvate and produces NADH and ATP. 
Drag the appropriate text to the blanks to complete the diagram of second stage reactions. Okay, so here we see uh, NAD being reduced to NADH by PDHC. Here we see NAD being reduced to NADH uh, by the Krebs cycle. What goes in this box here? FADH2 from Zoom, exactly. Okay. Now over here, let's see if you can remember what goes there. Um, Let me, CO2, somebody did remember, CO2 goes there. Very good, yeah, so we're, we're gonna produce two CO2. So remember we're- The Krebs cycle and the mitochondrial reactions that precede it break down pyruvate to carbon dioxide. Drag the appropriate text to the blanks to complete the diagram of electron transfer phosphorylation. Okay, uh, so now we're at the third stage of aerobic respiration. Um, let's do this box here first. So electrons, two electrons plus two protons plus something else. Oxygen, okay, oxygen's gonna be our final electron acceptor. Again, that's important because we need to keep the electrons moving through the chain to, to keep uh, operating the proton pumps. So. Finally, what do we get when we combine two electrons, two protons, and one half of an O2? I see from Zoom again, the Zoomers are really going for it today. Yeah, we get water. That's correct. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the third stage and combines with hydrogen to produce water. Okay. So again, this is already posted on eCampus. You can, um, if you wanna, for study, if you wanna go through this again, that's great. But you have to remember, there's two pretty big mistakes on this. Um, hopefully as you were watching, you picked up on some of the mistakes. So if anybody picked up on one, let me know. Can anybody see where any, there's, there's two glaring mistakes in particular. Good. So if you didn't, if the Zoomers didn't hear um, in class, in the Krebs cycle, we don't get eight, eight NADH. We get six NADH per glucose molecule, okay? That's one of the mistakes, okay? And, and it's a pretty big one. Anybody see another one? I'll give you guys a hint. The other one is in the Krebs cycle as well. You got the other one too, uh, if, if the Zoomers didn't hear that. Um, the second mistake is, sorry, I'm trying to get my, uh, my writing utensil here. So the first mistake's here. Okay, so for one molecule of glucose, six NAD are reduced to NADH. That is a horrible six. Let's see if I can draw a little bit better. Okay, so this should, this should be six NADH. And over here per glucose molecule, two FAD are reduced to FADH2. All right, so it's a pretty neat educational animation, except for the fact that there's two major mistakes on it. It's already posted on eCampus. I'll, um, I'll, I'll post a, a little notice underneath it uh, to make sure that you realize if you're using this to study that there, there's two big mistakes on this actually. All right, good, let's continue. All right, so the last thing we're gonna talk about is anaerobic respiration. So of course, of course, aerobic respiration is in the presence of oxygen. And this is very beneficial because we can extract an awful lot of energy from raw materials like glucose, okay? 36 ATP as compared to two ATP under anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic, aerobic means in the presence of oxygen. 
Anaerobic means in the absence of oxygen. In anaerobic respiration, we don't have molecular oxygen, O2, as a final electron acceptor. Um, we get a much lower yield of ATP. Um, you guys should be aware of this. I've actually been uh, saying this for a while. So we get two ATP per glucose molecule rather than 36. The problem we're facing, the problem the cell is facing with anaerobic respiration is regeneration of NAD. So there's a relatively small amount of NAD in cells. Okay. This is usually no problem when we're doing aerobic respiration because by giving up electrons to the electron transport chain, NADH is recycled to NAD. All right, then that NAD can go back and be used again and again and again. Okay. However, if we're doing aerobic respira anaerobic respiration, once NAD is reduced to NADH, because there's no oxygen to act as a final electron acceptor, the NADH can't give up its electrons to the electron transport chain, and we're stuck. Eventually, we're gonna, we're gonna run out of uh, NAD that hasn't been reduced to NADH. So how, do we, how does the cell deal with that? Well, the cell needs to find an alternate electron acceptor so it can give up, NADH can give up its electrons and be recycled back to NAD. Two examples of this. So we have lactate fermentation. Lactate fermentation happens in uh, some bacteria, uh, the muscles of your body as well. So in lactate fermentation, I'm gonna try to draw with the mouse. Um, this probably isn't gonna go well. But in lact lactate fermentation, the alternate electron acceptor is pyruvate. All right, that's not too bad. It looks like pyre, can I make the V better? There we go. Okay, so the alternate electron acceptor is pyruvate. Pyruvate is going to accept, the electrons from NADH. Oh man, I am not good at drawing with the mouse. So, NADH is going to be recycled to NAD. And what we're going to get is lactic acid or lactate. Okay, so again, this happens in the skeletal muscle. So this is probably, I'm sure we've all exercised intensely at some part of, of our lives. So there, there's two types of exercise. There's aerobic exercise where you're exercising, but not so intensely that oxygen can't get to your tissues. Okay, then there's anaerobic uh, exercise. So an anaerobic exercise, this would be something like doing sprints or lifting weights where you're exercising so intensely that oxygen can't get to your tissues fast enough, okay? When this happens, your skeletal muscles are gonna switch over from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration. So it's not getting uh, oxygen fast enough to use oxygen as a final electron acceptor. So it's gonna switch over and start using pyruvate as an alternate electron acceptor so it can recycle NADH back to NAD and at least keep doing glycolysis. Okay, so you might have heard um, if, if you're an athlete or did athletics in high school that when you exercise intensely like this, you get a lactic acid buildup in your muscles. Okay, that's where the lactic acid buildup comes from. It comes from anaerobic exercise when you're exercising too intensely uh, for oxygen to get to your tissues. Okay, um, another example, uh, alcohol fermentation in yeast. So this is a very commercially 
uh, important chemical reaction. So uh, yeast can take sugars like, uh, like maltose and convert it into alcohol. So if we, let's say we're making beer or wine, we're making a, a mash or making a mash to make whiskey or something. So uh, we take carbohydrates, we mix it with yeast, and then we want to put it in anaerobic conditions so that, so that it can ferment. Okay, so the fermentation is going to happen below the surface of that mash that we make where there's no oxygen. So when there's no oxygen, so yeast can do aerobic respiration under aerobic conditions, but if we force them into anaerobic conditions, like, like uh, making like a, a corn mash for making whiskey, let's say, then again, they're going to need an alternate electron acceptor. And in this case, it's going to be a molecule called acetaldehyde. Okay, and I apologize for my messy penmanship, but I'm just not that good with a mouse. Okay, so again, acetaldehyde is going to accept the electrons from NADH. Okay, um, then that's going to recycle NADH back to NAD. And the product is going to be ethanol or ethyl alcohol. Okay, so there's two examples of anaerobic respiration. So uh, basically the things to remember here is uh, the amount of NAD in the cell is pretty limited. There's not a lot of it. Uh, we have to keep reusing that NAD by recycling it. So we recycle it, we recycle NADH back to NAD by giving up its electrons. Okay, when we're doing aerobic respiration, it's constantly giving up electrons to the electron transport chain, so that constantly recycles it. Okay, if we're exercising so intensely that oxygen can't get to our tissues, we need to switch over to an alternate electron acceptor. Uh, in the case of our skeletal muscles, that's pyruvate. So pyruvate, by accepting electrons from NADH, can recycle it back to NAD, and we get lactic acid or lactate, as an example, okay, with yeast. Acetaldehyde is the final electron acceptor, and we get ethanol. Again, a very commercially important reaction because that's how we make beer, wine, um, anything that's fermented. Okay, that takes us to the end of, so we have, how much time do we have to start? Uh, we have about 15 minutes to, to start um, the next chapter, which we'll do. But before we do that, are there any questions on anything we covered today? Any questions on anything we covered in uh, chapter seven? Okay, if there's no questions. Let's start chapter 11. All right, so starting chapter 11. The good news, all of the hard materials behind you now, okay, the, the, the two toughest chapters that we're going to cover this semester are chapter six and chapter seven, so the photosynthesis and aerobic respiration. So from here on out, um, if you've been struggling with those two chapters, know that it, it's going to get easier from here on out. Um, also, another thing about uh, the way this course is set up is that it, it's kind of backloaded with a lot of points. So um, right now you just have points from your quizzes, points from one test. Um, then of course Monday we'll have the second test. But you know the comprehensive finals were 200 points. The uh, 
next test is worth 100 points. You've still got your, uh, your lab practical. Uh, you still have a lot of quizzes and so forth in labs. So um, I hope everybody is uh, keeping up with the material, but the last half of the, the, this course does get a little bit easier. So um, you, should be, uh, you should rest assured in that at least. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about how cells reproduce. Um, they reproduce by a process called mitosis. Mitosis is eukaryotic cell division and the process by which organisms grow or add new cells. So when an organism is uh, growing or, or develop, uh, developing embryos, a good example, um, they use mitosis to add new cells to get bigger. Uh, this is also the process by which uh, organisms replace old cells or dead cells. So um, cells don't last forever. Um, different types of cells have uh, different longevities. Uh, for example, the cells lining your stomach, uh, they last about three days before they, they turn over. Um, cells in your bones, uh, these can last years, uh, 10 years or so. Okay, so different cells have different longevities, but eventually they wear out and they need to be replaced. They're gonna be replaced by, uh, by the process of mitosis. Also repair damaged tissue. So uh, because of illness or injury, uh, cells might die off. And of course we need to, to repair the damage. Um, and we do this by uh, making more cells through mitosis. So mitosis is, uh, and again, remember this is only in eukaryotic cells. Uh, prokaryotic cells uh, use a, a, a different method to, uh, to reproduce. Okay, mitosis is also the process by which single-celled eukaryotes reproduce. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, you guys got to look at some protozoans under the microscope, uh, single-celled animals. So you looked at some uh, euglena, some uh, paramecium, some amoebas. Um, the way that they make more amoebas, the, the way they make more paramecium is by mitosis. So they, they divide into, and from one parent cell, we get two new daughter cells. Okay, so there is a very organized series of events uh, that happen when a cell is going to divide. Um, and that's called the cell cycle. Okay, the cell cycle. We can split the cell cycle into two parts. Um, and I wanna draw on the board for this. So let me, okay, for those joining by Zoom, I'm gonna put that blank um, text document up again, just to, uh, so I have a nice white background to draw on. Oops, wrong, wrong one. Okay, it looks like everybody can, uh, can I'm not gonna bother sharing that. Looks like everybody can see. Okay, so we can split the cell cycle up into two major parts. Uh, we have mitosis or M phase, and then we have interphase. So, oh, I don't wanna do this. Okay. Okay, so here's the cell cycle. And we can break it up into two major divisions. We have M phase or mitosis.
Okay, so that goes to, from here to here in the cell cycle. And from here all the way around to here, we have interphase. Okay, so the two major divisions are M phase and interphase. Okay, so we can further break interphase down into three subdivisions. So we can break interphase down into G1, S, and G2. So from here to here, we have G1. Here to here in the bottom, we have S phase. And from here to here, we have G2. M phase or mitosis, we can further break that down into four subdivisions. We have prophase. Metaphase. Anaphase. And telophase. Okay, so we can break down mitosis. I'm just gonna use uh, initials. We can further break this down into P phase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Then at the end of telophase, we have the physical division of the cell into two daughter cells, okay? And that happens right here, where we get the physical division, and that's called cytokinesis. Okay, so that's just a, a general overview of the cell cycle. Now, this actually shouldn't be too unfamiliar to you because I believe in last week's lab, you, you guys did the mitosis lab, okay? So again, that's the, the, the cell cycle. So again, the, the two major divisions in the cell cycle, we can break it up into M phase, which is also known as mitosis and interphase. M phase has four parts, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Interphase has three parts, G1, S, and G2. And then after telophase, we have cytokinesis, which is the physical division of a parent cell into two new daughter cells. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so again here, this is basically what I, uh, I, I prefer to draw this on the board, but all the information's here. So uh, interphase can be divided into G1, S, and G2. Interphase is from here to here on the cell cycle. Uh, mitosis or M phase consists of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. That's from here to here on the cell cycle. And then uh, right between telophase and G1 of interphase, uh, this is where we have cytokinesis or the physical division of the parent cell into two new daughter cells. Okay, so first let's talk about the three parts of interphase. Uh, the first part of interphase is uh, G1, 
which stands for GAP1. This is an interval of normal cell growth and function before DNA replication. So if we're say, for example, I, I talked about the, uh, the lining of your stomach, which are epithelial cells. So during uh, G1 phase, the epithelial cells in your stomach are just doing the job that they're supposed to do. Okay. Uh, for bone cells during G1, they're just doing the normal job of, of bone cells. Okay. So this is a, a period of normal growth and function. Once a cell crosses from G1 into S phase, it's committed to dividing at this point. Okay. S stands for synthesis, and this is where DNA is replicated. So if a cell is going to divide in two, it needs two sets of chromosomes, okay, one for each of the two new daughter cells. So S phase is where, are where the chromosomes are replicated so that we have a, a new set of chromosomes for each of the two new daughter cells. Okay, so that's S phase right here in the cell cycle. G2, GAP2 is an interval following DNA replication and before mitosis begins. Um, I think a better definition for G2 is an interval of growth prior to division. So what, what's happening in G2 is the cell is making sure it's got enough stuff basically to divide into two cells. So in G2, there's, there's different checkpoints in G2. The cell is gonna make, you know, do I have enough mitochondria for two new cells? Uh, do I have enough plasma membrane to make two new cells? Uh, are there enough charged tRNAs for two new cells? Okay, so it, it's gonna make sure there's, there's enough stuff. And also there's gonna be a, a period of growth in G2. So it's gonna, the cell's gonna grow to make sure it has enough stuff to divide into two cells. Okay, so a little more about um, interphase. During S phase of interphase, this is where a DNA replication takes place. Um, so let's talk about what we're looking at over here uh, on this side of the, uh, this figure on the right side of the slide. Uh, this is called a karyotype. Let me write that word down. It's probably one you haven't heard before. You're not going to have to know this for the test. This is just for your own information. And what you're looking at in this karyotype, um, these are actual chromosomes from a human cell. Okay, so what you do is, um, in order to do a, a karyotype in the lab, um, you, you use a, a special chemical to arrest the cells uh, during mitosis so that the chromosomes are nice and condensed like this. Um, then you break them open and under the microscope, you, you, you take a picture. And in the old days, they used to actually take the, the paper picture and use scissors to cut out each of the chromosomes and then match up the chromosomes uh, pairwise to make a karyotype, this type of a, a, a thing here. Of course, nowadays with computers, it's a lot easier. You know, we, we can cut and paste using like uh, Photoshop rather than actually cutting and pasting. But these are the actual chromosomes from an actual human cell, okay? Um, of course, humans have 46 individual chromosomes. You get one set of 23 chromosomes from your mother, one set of, of 23 chromosomes from your father. So here's each of the 23 sets of chromosomes. So I have a question for you guys to see if you, you know. So, so looking at this karyotype, can you tell me if this came from a male or a female? I'm not seeing anything on Zoom. Female, okay. Um, so the female, that was an answer from Zoom. Um, I'm not gonna ask for an explanation from Zoom, but looking down here, the X and the Y chromosomes, these are the sex chromosomes. Uh, this individual is XX. 
So two X chromosomes, the female. Okay, if there was one X and one Y chromosome, that would mean that this karyotype came from a male. Each chromosome, uh, chromosomes vary in size. Each chromosome contains hundreds or thousands of genes. Each gene codes for a protein. So again, so, uh, here are some of the bigger chromosomes. And I just see I'm a little bit, going a little bit later than I did. Um, let's go ahead and stop here. Um, this is the last material that you're gonna need to know uh, for the exam. Again, remember the exam's coming up on the 19th. Um, Quiz number 12 will be posted online by about noon today. Also look for a study guide to be posted later today and please have a look at it before Friday. Okay, I went a little later than I wanted to so I'm not gonna talk much more. If there's no questions from Zoom, I'm going to uh, end the meeting and I'll see you guys Friday for the review session.